Okay, welcome to Tips for Painless Passkeys. My name is Matt Miller. I am a technical lead working on passwordless at Duo Security at Cisco. So plenty of hands-on experience implementing passkeys and dealing with all of their pros and cons. Um, I'm a WebAuthn subject matter expert uh, with an eye on the relying party's experience. I also I like to focus on the developer experience and try to make the API easier to use. Because if you make it easy to use, the developers are going to want to use it, which will help with adoption. I think that's generally a good thing for WebAuthn. Um, I'm author of the TypeScript library, Simple WebAuthn. That's my personal WebAuthn library. Uh, I also um, maintain the Pi WebAuthn library and WebAuthn.io as my, part of my day job at Cisco. And in addition to my day-to-day -day job, I also help drive FIDO2 adoption within the FIDO Alliance, their technical working group and the W3C's Web Authentication Working Group and the Web Authent Adoption Community Group. That's also me on the homepage. <laughs> uh, so passkeys, a bit of a double-edged sword, I would say. So but prior to synced passkeys, um, they were, pass Web Authent was kind of easy to reason about when a credential would be available, when it's not uh, gonna be something usable. Device binding was kind of the, the letter uh, of the law back then, but synced passkeys, for sake of consumer adoption, made WebAuthn available in more places. But this also increased the number of permutations uh, in which a relying party needs to try and intuit when a credential may or may not be available. So what we've seen over time is questions shift within the last, just even the last year, last 12 months, questions have shifted from how do we use WebAuthn? Just the basics of implementing this stuff. Moving on to how can we improve the user experience? Like we have uh, systems in place now. People are using pass keys for authentication, but it's got some rough edges. How do we improve those? How can we help users understand where their pass keys are stored? Because it's not just in the browser. It's not just on the machine. Now you have pass key providers, both first and third party, that are storing them. So how can you kind of, instead of calling everything a pass key, could you do something better? How can we follow through on name change requests? This is a general theme of, Humans um, are, like people, are a, a complicated thing that change often, and uh, can passkeys adapt to that um, you know, over time? And also there's this big problem that's kind of revealing itself if, with embedded or native application use of WebAuthn. There are many foot guns in that space, and I wanna try and help answer some questions about um, you know, how, to, how to use it. So passkeys are good, but they can be better. Oh, that's so here's the first problem, nicknaming passkeys. So a user comes in and they register uh, a passkey with your website, like what do you call it? You just call it a passkey? Not such a great idea because if they register multiple passkeys and they're all called passkey, it makes it difficult to manage, uh, to manage them. In addition, browsers and platforms uh, are working together outside of the influence of the RP to offer passkeys for use, including across devices. Third party providers have entered this space to offer cross uh, operating system sync in a way that first party passkey providers, they've been focused on syncing across their respective, you know, within their platform, their ecosystem I've been calling them, but now you have third, P, third party passkey providers that are sort of breaching the, the divide between ecosystems and it can, be, it can become a problem for relying parties. So with all of these various permutations, all of these combinations, what can a relying party do to help their users understand where their pass keys, which provider their pass key is stored with. So let's look at solutions. The first one is kind of the current state of things. Things are, are, are pretty good right now. So one thing you can do, if you're familiar with AA GUID, it's a random unique, uh, it's like a random identifier that's decided by a provider to help relying parties figure out which provider uh, provided the pass key. Now we're, we're getting them now in, uh, previously, before synced pass keys, you would get direct attestation would be the way you would get a legitimate AA GUID because it would be something cryptographically verifiable. You could chain it back to a known hardware manufacturer and you could, you know, uh, you could do things like only accept authentication from certain makes and models of authenticators. Platform authenticators were sort of hesitant to um, offer an AA GUID and so what we're getting now is sort of the happy, uh, like this middle ground for UX hinting, RPs are being given unattested AA GUIDs. So these are values that the provider returns, but there's nothing cryptographically chaining them back to an actual provider. So you could have 
some shenanigans there, but for the most part, just assume everyone's doing their thing. When you have this value, there's actually now a list of providers that you could do a simple lookup based on AA GUID. And you could say, okay, I'm gonna get this, you know, 1D2, uh, 832, blah, blah, blah. And you look it up and it says, okay, this is Bitwarden. So when, the user, when a user registers their credential uh, in my dashboard for the user on their control panel or whatever, I'm gonna say Bitwarden. And for most users, that's probably gonna be enough for them to remember, oh yeah, I can sign in with Bitwarden. I just need to you know, set it up on a new computer. When you don't have that value, then what you have to do is you have to build heuristics based on things like browser user agent, backup flags, transports, authenticator attachment, like all these uh, various signals, you can kind of piece them together and get to a fairly decent um, uh, uh, nickname that you can name your credentials uh, in lieu of the AA GUID. But things are going to get better. So right now in WebAuthn, there is an extension called CredProps, Credential Properties. It's called, uh, so in, within CredProps, within the L3 draft that's being finalized as we speak, there is an addition called Authenticator Display Name. And what this is going to help with is going to be a way for the provider which has way more context and can provide more information than the RP has access to, to essentially tell the RP, here's the nickname you should give this credential. And so what's great about that is, in our before, we, we could get to a provider name, Bitwarden. But what Bitwarden could do with, via authenticator display name extension is give to the RP bitwarden Time Vault. That's the name of the user's vault within Bitwarden that this is stored within to help give that user uh, a better chance of understanding which vault in their multi-vault setup, the passkey is located. Pretty neat. So the next problem I want to talk about is updating passkey metadata. Something that is a detail about using passkeys that is uh, pretty non-obvious is that during registration, the relying party specifies a username and a display name. Things like an email address, a phone number, a uh, first and last name, that kind of thing. And that is what shows up to the user what the browser shows the user outside of the RP's control at authentication time so that the user has an idea of what account they're signing into. Now here you'll see in the image here, I misspelled my name. I forgot I have double consonants in my name and now I'm Matthew Myler and it's like I decide I want to fix that. Well, how do I do that? It's a little trickier than you might think. Uh, the problem is that once this username, display name, metadata are within uh, um, are given to an authenticator, and the authenticator stores it during a registration, the RP doesn't really have a good way to feed that back to the authenticator to update. So it's, it's kind of a pain point. People change names all the time. People change email addresses that they use, that they associate with their account, or change phone numbers. You know, these things change. We are people, and these are realities of our life. How do we get the systems to adapt to those? So here's what is currently technically feasible, if you actually go in. Uh, one thing about passkeys is that they are discoverable credentials. Discoverable credentials means that an authenticator stores the credential material for a given hashed RP ID and a user ID. So there's a basically a lookup table within the authenticator saying for this user and this RP, here's a credential for them. When you perform multiple registrations with the same RP ID and the same username, you will overwrite the previously existing one if there is there. So therein is our technique for updating the username is you prepare your registration options with the new name, with the updated version of it. You leave out the credential you want to overwrite from the registration options, which will mean you won't get that, oh, sorry, you've already registered this device error, and the authenticator that hopefully the user uses for this second registration event will overwrite the one with the bad name. Mission accomplished. Unless the user forgets which authenticator they use, and now they have two credentials, one with the actual real username and one with the bad username. So then it's kind of things get messy for the, for the RP. So here's what you have to look forward to in the future. Turns out it's a tough problem to solve, so you can look forward to lots of discussion about this. Uh, so within the WebAuthn working group, this is something that RPs want. Like, I am out there pushing for something like this. I'm adding my voice to other RPs that want to update the properties of a credential, keep the relying party's knowledge of valid credentials for a user, and the state of the authenticator and the state of the provider maintaining those credentials. Because right now, there is not really a good means of communication between the two. And so you can have state fall out of sync very, very easily. Uh, if you are um, interested in sort of adding your voice to this, the uh, Web Authentication Working Group has, you know, we do all our stuff out in the open via GitHub issues and, and PRs. 
um, issue 1967 is the one in which we're having this discussion. And um, if you add your voice to it, it would be appreciated from an RP's perspective. And if you have any suggestions, we'd be all ears. So now this is the third. Um, this is the third main point. WebAuthn is a browser API. And for the most part, when people talk about using passkeys, they're talking about opening up Chrome or Firefox or Safari and performing your sign-in in these evergreen browsers that are updating pretty often and um, adding WebAuthn capabilities uh, at a pretty good clip. Where things start to sort of fall apart is in native applications. Because native applications have to implement something that can render a browser to call the browser API. Uh, so I'll start with that first. So um, the problem with implementing web views is that it's, way, it's very easy to do it improperly. Or an app has been around with a web view that is very old, and there's nobody around to maintain the app. And so it is of, uh, the burden of the relying party to build logic to try and do feature detection and understand when WebAuthn is or is not available, keep the users out of it, devise alternatives to WebAuthn authentication when WebAuthn is not available. And there are some fundamental issues, like the, uh, there are uh, odd errors that you only get when an error occurs in a web view. Sometimes web, web views will lie to you. A really weird issue that we came across at Cisco was there would be a native app where we would do all our feature detection. Public key credential was defined. Is UVPAA was returning true? And then we would, we would show the UI, and when the user clicked it, immediately there would be an error. There would be no prompt to use a, a pass key, and we would get this error navigator credentials create APIs only permitted in applications with the com.apple.developer.web-browser entitlement. OK, I guess it's an entitlement issue. And so like at that point, what do you do? You, know, you have done your due diligence. You have tried to keep the user out of an authentication scenario in which they're not going to do it, and then you use some alternative. But here you have a web view in a native app that is missing something outside of the influence of the RP, and there's nothing you can really do about it. So like, how does an RP kind of adapt to all of this? And the best, the best thing, well, OK, so let's talk about you know, what you do. And I think I touched on this. Like, when WebAuthn is, is not available, what do you do? You support username and password and fishable 2FA? Say it with me and now, boo, boo, that's not the way to do it. No. Um, sometimes you can open the default browser and handle it there and, and like, complete the authentication in the browser and have the native app communicating with the same server and you know, do the session negotiation and stuff like that. And that's kind of tough to wire up if that's not your specialty. And you know, I throw the big shrug there because it's like it's a very it's kind of a tough problem to solve. So the one the one bone I kind of want to throw out there for RP developers is there are very uh, there is a very discrete list of preferred web views for RP developers to implement now in their native apps to properly support WebAuthn. And I offered this slide up as sort of like a one-stop shop for developers that are interested. You, if you're on an Apple ecosystem, you're developing for iOS, macOS, iPadOS, use AS Web Authentication Session. It is well documented by Apple. Uh, my understanding is it's pretty easy uh, to get up and running, and you don't have to do a lot of custom coding in order for this to work. Google on Android has Chrome custom tabs. That's pretty much what Google says you should be using. Um, and on Microsoft, so on Windows, the preferred embedded web view is Edge Web View 2. So I have links here. Uh, you can Google these just as easily. These are the names that you need to remember if you are a native app developer and you need to back your authentication with something WebAuthn based. You're going to want to use these for the best user experience and the, the highest chance that a user can complete authentication. So it turns out web views are not the only way to handle this authentication as well. You can also do it natively. You want to use all your you know, like native uh, form controls uh, that the platform offers. Uh, both Apple and Google offer APIs for that. So Apple, it's a very long name, so I put a link to the general category. I think it's like AS uh, authentication. I'm not even going to try. Go search for supporting passkeys on Apple, and you will find a, a plethora of information on that. Google. Uh, for Android, has a Jetpack API called Credential Manager that is sort of the latest and greatest way of accessing um, the same credential store, the same credentials that a user has using the same interface that a user would get in the browser, just in your native app. And you can orchestrate an authentication flow using the same credentials that a user would use on your website, just in a native application. 
So I think we'll take a pause now um, for some Q&A. We don't have any. We don't okay. Have anyone that yet. Okay. So yeah, anybody here, you have any questions? Yep. Yeah. So, are there any recommendations for RPs who have implemented the web authentication in previous versions and have a huge population to upgrade to fast keys because that's yet another friction. So, how do we do painless upgrade for those users? Oh, like the migration? Yeah. Um, and you're talking about you already have web authentication in play? Yeah. Yeah, like device bound keys, web authentication exists for a couple of years, a huge population using it. Oh. And Passkeys is there, but any suggestions to, to reduce that experience? Because what we are told is you have to go through registration ceremony again. But right. not much content guidelines or UX guidelines, because upgrade is different than registering for the first time, right? So, right. so any suggestions for that? Yeah, the focus uh, on a lot of the content for migration to passkeys is focused on username, password, some kind of 2FA into passkeys. But I, your, your question is more about going from device-bound passkeys to synced passkeys. And how can, you, how can you do that? Or like the best way to do that? So in, in terms of UX flows, I would, the UX working group I, I know is going to get to that question because it is a very important one. Um, in my, just off the top of my head, you do, um, you do get back signals about the backup eligibility of a credential. And when you see backup eligible is false, that a user just successfully auth with, you could throw up a page. You have to do that double registration, like you said, because there's no way to like upgrade a backup eligible false credential into a backup eligible state. Um, if it starts out backup eligible false, it will always be backup eligible false. So you do have to replace or add via an additional registration ceremony, unfortunately. Hi. Um, as an RP, is it, uh, is it necessary to like test whether your implementation works across many different devices and platforms, or can you just kind of say it'll be fine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think as many as you think are kind of like your, your critical path, um, I think that's going to come down to trying to get a feel for the demographics of your majority users identifying their, their common use cases, and absolutely making sure that if you can, set up end-to-end -end testing, or set up like front-end testing. Uh, Sauce Labs is a, is a great company for that. I know there are others out there. Browser Stack has some automation frameworks you can use as well to do that, end -end, that front-end testing and uh, try and stay ahead of it. Um, you, can have, you can have your users, your developers specifically, try to use multiple browsers and try to test across them as they're building stuff out. That's kind of a nice way. I use Chrome Beta you know, as my day-to-day -day browser because it keeps me a month or two out ahead of changes that will land in stable that might be too disruptive for less tolerant people than me. Um, or your, your customers, I guess, is another way you could say that. So uh, that's, a, that's another hint I might have for you. Like it's setting up, setting up front-end testing is pretty tricky if you don't have a team dedicated to it. It's very energy intensive to get that up and running. It will pay dividends if you do, because it will give you an opportunity to more quickly identify when a browser OS update might break something about your flow. So if you can, I'd say try it. Try, try for it. Um, I had a question regarding the credential stores. So let's say if, uh, if you have an app which is on iOS and Android, and our app is using the credential store that is there on Android, do you have anything in mind on how that same person can use the same passkey on, let's say, an iOS, or there is no solution for all? The current solution to that problem is leverage a third-party passkey provider. Um, if you're talking about you're talking about using a single passkey across all of a user's many devices, like, is there a possibility of synchronizing, let's say, a passkey which is stored on Androids? Like Google, store Google password to manager. somewhere else. Yeah. Or do we have to, oh. like for example, if I have an app um, which is storing there, mm -hmm. should I, as a product, say that, okay, you need to use one password mm -hmm. to synchronize this from Android's key store to iOS or? 
Um, okay, so credential migration between providers is uh, very much a work in progress. There's only, it's at, like the concept stage right now. So very, very early days and nothing is on the horizon as far as I know. Okay. Um, to the question of like maximizing uh, passkey availability, I think that the, the truth now is that you should set up registration such that your users can register multiple passkeys uh, for the various providers that they have right now because they are kind of locked to the provider right now and the provider's capabilities. Um, and I think that's just the truth of where we're at right now until we can get something that's like a, pa like a password manager migration, like you just kind of copy or paste your stuff over. We're not at that stage with, with pass keys specifically. So that's why I think it's important to give people the ability to bootstrap registration from a new device, for example, and let them add something new if they can't use any of their existing pass keys. Uh, there is work going on at the FIDO Alliance to define uh, credential secret. Uh, no, it's with, um, uh, I, uh, I'll have to check and get back to you on that one. It's, it's between a couple of uh, organizations, I think, at this point. And, and because the desire is there, it's just kind of figuring out who, own, who might be best to own it. Yeah. Here, here's first. Oh, sure. Hey, um, you mentioned Chrome custom tabs for uh, native application support for pass keys. Have you seen any significant um, differences or incompatibilities with the various Chrome custom tab um, providers, right? So like on a lot of especially Chinese phones, you'll not find Chrome there backing the CCT. It'll actually be something else that doesn't always support all the same things. That is a great platform specific question that unfortunately I don't have any insights for you. I, my Android development days are very far behind me. And um, these are resources that I've asked people in the know to just to confirm because I wanted to you know, give good advice. But I don't have practical implementation advice for you on that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. We have a question over here. OK, so um, you touched upon one point wherein um, so part of creating passkey, we provide the display name. And uh, it can be a first name, last name, or email ID, whatever. It can change, right? So, right. Uh, so I, I couldn't understand the solution what you were proposing here uh, because uh, exclude credentials, one of the spec item you touched upon. How to use that part of the credentials dot create? Can you explain a little more further? The exclude credentials? Yeah. So how it can be exercised to avoid that problem? Oh, right. So the point I was trying to make with that is normally in a in a typical registration ceremony, you want to include all of the user's current credentials and exclude credentials. So they don't override anything. Um, and because authenticators, providers will typically error out going, no, you've already registered me. There's no need to create another one. By omitting the one with the bad metadata, the credential ID with the, that has the bad metadata associated with it, because it's a, it's a map uh, internally on how a credential is stored for a user ID and an RP ID, by omitting one of those entries from exclude credentials, you allow the existing credential to be overridden with a new one that has the correct metadata. So uh, here the overridden is happening based on that user.id property. That's correct. They're mapped by the hash of the RPID and the user ID. So as long as those are the same, the old credential and its metadata will get overwritten with the new so, credential and new metadata. Yeah, to make that metadata override, then we need to ask the user to enroll for the passkey again? It would be essentially a new registration ceremony, yes. Hmm. Okay, so then we have to keep a note that whenever user is changing the first name, last name, or email, then we have to keep a note that, okay, so this user needs to uh, enroll again to override the right. existing passkey. You, okay. You're going to have to wire, out, uh, wire up the, U the, the experience for that, and, and that's kind of RP specific, depending on yeah. how you want to handle that. Cool. And, and second question is like, uh, so consider, um, so we don't know exactly who is the Apple user uh, logged into the account. Now consider uh, one laptop, two Apple accounts. So one app account, I created a couple of accounts for one of the RP. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, as a RP, I don't know. Uh, now the user is same Apple user or a, a different oh, Apple yeah, user. Yeah. Now, I will not ask the user to enroll for passkey because in my system for that laptop, uh, and uh, there are a couple of accounts are there. For the new Apple account, I don't have any clue that old Apple account, I created account, or new Apple account, I created an account. So I will be silent. So the user will not create a passkey, right? Uh, yeah, if we're assuming syncing is in the mix, I guess. No, but Apple accounts are different. Okay. Maybe, maybe we can talk out in the hall about it, because okay. it sounds like there's a, there's a bit of nuance there that I'm not, I don't think I'm fully under, okay, understanding, but I'd be okay, happy to yeah. help try and, and peel that apart for you. Cool. 
So, so that we are out of time, yeah, so maybe sorry. just close it. Yeah. Just one last yeah, one. Yes, yeah. Yes. So if you want to find me online, I'm on Mastodon now. I am Kale at infosec.exchange. Uh, the Web the WebAuthn adoption community group is also available for anyone to join. You don't have to be uh, a member of the, the working group. Uh, Passkeys.dev is a great website with tons of resources for developers interested in sort of passkey implementation best practices. And then there are links to my WebAuthn libraries if you want to check them out. So thank you very much. Okay. We'll resume the next session, 205. Thank you.